Good afternoon. I'm George Hepworth with Grover Park Consulting. In the first three videos in my new series, Power Apps for Microsoft Access Developers, I showed you how we can overcome one of the uh, issues that frequently has been an impediment or a hurdle for a lot of Microsoft Access Developers who were interested in Power Apps but didn't necessarily think it was going to be a good fit for their work. Specifically, I'm talking about the limitation on the number of records that can be loaded into a Power Apps application by default. That's 500 records uh, is the base setting up that's configurable up to 2,000 records. And, and for me and for a lot of uh, Access developers who didn't pursue it very far, that seemed like a, a showstopper. Most of our record sets that we work with in, in the desktop world are, are thousands or even hundreds of thousands of records, and that just seemed like an impossible situation. However, there are ways to address that, and I showed you in those three videos one way to approach that. But also, in thinking through that process, it, 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 it should be clear to us as access developers that we really don't want to load enormous record sets initially into our applications anyway. By default, we prefer to load a form, for example, with maybe one record that we're going to add or update. Uh, perhaps there will be a list box that shows all of the available records and we select from that. But we never really load multiple thousands of records into a form uh, anyway. Now, we may want to work with those large record sets for reporting purposes or aggregation or summary. But by and large, uh, this uh, limitation that seems artificial at first really isn't such a significant factor or a hurdle. And, and I think by dispelling that and getting it out of the way, I think we can focus more on how we can use the Power Apps in application to extend the power of our existing desktop access relational database applications into the mobile world, where we can run some part of that application, some key function of that application, on a phone, or on a tablet, or in a browser, and thereby extend that, or excuse me, I should say leverage that existing fully developed relational database application into a whole new environment and take advantage of both worlds. So for that reason, I'm going to build with you a demo application and explain as we do uh, the thinking that goes into each step along the way, how it works, uh, the decisions I made in deciding how to design it and how to build it so that you can see uh, the process of working from a Microsoft Access mindset towards a Power Apps application mindset and extending that power and flexibility and functionality into a new environment and uh, thereby extend our own toolkits uh, as we go. Before I do that, I, I thought it would be a good idea to tell you a little bit more about myself. I am a retired access developer. I work for small companies, large corporations, and I was an independent uh, consultant for, for many years as well. I'm now retired and enjoying the benefits of retirement in several ways, one of which is the freedom to do projects like this one. I'm an author or co-author of several books on access, including the original Grover Park George on access. I co-authored with Ben Clothier two books on access. The first was Microsoft Access in a SharePoint World, which focused on the 2010 Access Web Databases, uh, Tim Runcie uh, contributed to the SharePoint portion of that book. In 2013, I worked again with Ben on the Access Web App portion of the book, Professional Access 2013 Programming, along with Teresa Henning and Doug Yudovich. 
Currently, I'm on the core admin team at Utter Access. We are an online access forum where we try to provide support and answers to uh, new developers and experienced developers as they develop their Utter Access, excuse me, as they develop their Access Relational Database Application Solutions. I'm a former Microsoft Access MVP and I am enjoying the heck out of being retired. Some of the resources that I relied on during the course of my initial studies with Power Apps, getting up to speed from, from the beginning and as I've progressed along learning more about it, have been the following. Uh, I found the two introductory uh, YouTube videos that Carl Donabauer and Maria Barnes produced were very helpful in getting uh, the sort of basic groundwork set for how Power Apps uh, can be integrated with uh, an Access developer's world. Uh, Carl, in particular, has has been a big influence on, on me um, and my understanding of how Power Apps can, can uh, fit into a, an Access Developer's Toolkit. The two resources that I have found most useful in terms of the technical uh, aspects of, of working with Power Apps are Shane Young and Reza Durrani. They both have YouTube channels and they're both very good uh, at producing content that's helpful, informative, focused, understandable and uh, accessible to to anyone who's interested in, in learning more about uh, Power Apps and how to effectively implement Power App solutions. As far as resources to find answers to specific questions, the Power Apps forums at the URL you see here has proven to be the most uh, the most productive place where I found specific answers to specific questions about using Power Apps. The Microsoft documentation itself is very good on explaining how you do certain things, but not so good at helping you understand why you would want to use that particular function in a situation and how to implement it. Uh, the forums are much more practical or, or practically oriented towards solving specific problems that Power Apps developers encounter. So, from this point forward, we're going to be building together. I'll, I'll start with the very beginning and work with you through the final implementation of a Power Apps application called Mike's Mobile Library. Mike's Mobile Library is an application that you could use to create a catalog of all the existing books in your personal library along with photos of all the covers of all of those books for quick reference. The database behind this Power Apps application will be SharePoint lists. Uh, during most of the latter part of my Access development career, I worked with either SQL Server or SQL Azure, and I'm more comfortable, I think, working with SQL Server databases. However, for the purposes of this uh, demo application, I decided that SharePoint lists were more practical in two ways. First, uh, they are part of the Power Apps environment. Well, both Power Apps and SharePoint are part of the same Microsoft 365 environment and it's easier to work within that environment in a self-contained manner, I, I, I felt. Plus, uh, SQL Server and SQL Azure are two of the premium services for which you pay extra if you're going to use them with a Power Apps application. So to avoid the additional cost of working with a, a SQL Azure uh, database, we'll stick with SharePoint lists for your portion of, of this uh, mobile library, but keep in mind as we go that it would be very easy at any point to upsize from SharePoint lists into SQL Azure 
if you end up with uh, 30, 40, 50,000 volumes in your library. So we're ready to begin. Phase one, I'm going to demo the working application as it exists today. Okay, we're now looking at Mike's mobile library, which is an access desktop application. The data for this relational database application is actually SharePoint lists in my 365 account. Uh, I used SharePoint lists for this application because it will have an extension in the Power Apps environment for one specific function. And that function will be uh, taking photos or pictures of the album, excuse me, not album, but book covers of the books and other media that I incorporate into this library. In other words, we have a single data storage, SharePoint lists, Linked to that data storage, we have the Access front end. We also have the PowerPoint application. So we can share the data back and forth between both environments. Let's start by looking at the fundamental element of, of a library, which is the publications. In this library, we primarily have books, but it's set up to catalog and include in our library periodicals or magazines, DVDs or CDs, and theoretically there could be a VHS tape or two involved. This is a lookup table. Each type of publication is categorized by the genre. For example, literary fiction is the majority uh, of the material. There's also software development or uh, romance, dystopian literature, and so on. We track the publishers, and again, this is a lookup table, as is the, the, the genre table. And as we add new volumes into our library, we capture the publisher of those books. And this is going to be a finite list, uh, although there are many more publishers than, than I might have thought originally. We track the condition of our materials, everything from mint, still in the wrapper, all the way through trashed, and I have no idea why I'm hanging on to this. And again, another lookup table. We can select a publication to review in detail. Uh, for example, this is a book of short stories. Uh, it includes uh, some really interesting short stories about the state of Wyoming. It's written by one of my favorite authors, Annie Prohl. And I'm getting off track, so let me refocus here. In addition to looking at each publication individually, we have the option to select all publications, in which case our navigation buttons appear and we can scroll through all of the, uh, all of the publications in our library. At this point, we only have 23 volumes or 23 items in the library. If the library reaches several thousand or, or potentially tens of thousands of, of items, this feature may become undesirable. Uh, we do, one of our fundamental principles as access developers is not to overload the interface by trying to bring in all of the potential records in a record set. It works fine here because we are still looking at only 23 records where we can focus on one single record. The next important element of a library are the creators. Now, creator could either be an author or the designer-builder 
of a uh, DVD, the, the, the producer, the director, and so on, of those people who have collaborated to create a DVD. And these are the authors uh, that I have identified so far as participating in one or more of the volumes in my library. Again, we can look at all creators or only a single creator. We have a junction table, and in the junction table we link each publication to one or more creators or authors, and we also are able to link each author to one or more of their publications. This one by default picked up Gene Owl. I think that's a bug. It should have defaulted to nothing. I'll have to look at that after I finish this demo. Gene Owl wrote several volumes in this series, and actually I only have three cataloged. I believe there are at least two more that I don't have cataloged yet. Uh, we can look at uh, Ben Clothier. He was co-author on this volume, and I incorrectly named that. So let's take a moment and go back and correct that. And now that is Professional Access Program. Let's go back to Creator Publication. And now it is correct. Typical functionality in an access relational de desktop application front end. We looked at creators to publications. We have a second form where we can look at publications and the people who participated in creating that publication. In this case, there are four co-authors of this volume called Professional Access 2013 Programming. Many to many. A second element of the library is acquiring and uh, disposing of volumes. On the side of the individuals, organizations involved in transfers of, of items, books or DVDs, into or out of the library, we have <coughs> generically called participants. A participant can be either a vendor uh, that sold the book or other media to me as the library owner. Uh, or the library owner himself, and actually this was designed for, for Mike, so he, he is recorded as the library owner. I am a participant in that I also have volumes in this library. It's my initial load of, of, of volumes uh, that populates the database. And then two other uh, related people who are who participate by lending volumes or borrowing volumes from the library. The participant status, we list several statuses. The owner, it's the entity owning a publication purchased or donated to the library. A donor, someone, an entity, which donated a publication to the library. Seller, buyer, buyer is someone who came to a used book sale, for example, or, or a garage sale and bought one of the books out of the library and took it away. Someone that could lend a book, or someone who could borrow the book from the library. Um, I needed a way to indicate when one of those loaned materials came back or went out or returned to the original owner. So we have a, a status in a transaction of, of a return. And custodian is, is basically a a catch-all for anything that didn't fit one of the others. I believe we're ready to look at the actual transfer of a publication. We do that in this form. In this form we have a record of all of the transfers of, of the different items in our library. Uh, 
we have a list of the publications, and so far there's only this short list. Eventually this will reach dozens and dozens and dozens as, as the library is completed. Or excuse me, as the catalog in my library is completed. I should be more specific. The participants, this consists of the individuals involved, uh, the sellers of, of materials, and uh, potentially uh, a person who is listed here as an individual could also be an entity like the library owner. This is the type of transaction in which that person was involved for that publication on that date with that estimated value. So if we select 1984, it shows me that Amazon Books sold that publication. Excuse me, sold that publication on June first for fifteen dollars. If I select Amazon Books and seller, it maintains that selection. However, if I switch to owner, it now shows that owner record. And if I select myself as the owner, that stays the same. This is really more of a shortcut to highlight items. Potentially this list is going to be several hundred or, or thousands of records long, so this is a quick and easy way to find them. Uh, I built in this, this highlighting system. Now I have a volume, I believe, Shelters of Stone. We'll select that. And there's the Shelters of Stone. I have only the seller record. I don't have the purchase side of that, or in this case, the owner side of that. And I'm going to copy the date and value. And the estimated value. So owner participant, publication, transfer date, and estimated value. And I will create that transfer. And now I appear as the owner. If I try to create a duplicate, shelters of stone, participant, owner, date, and value, I get an error message saying that that transfer or a transfer with those values was already completed. However, if I indicate that I am going to lend it out, and I want to create a transfer for this transaction. It allows me to do that. And now I have a lender. I loaned it out to someone, but a lender requires a borrower. So I'm going to select a borrower and create the other side of that transaction. So now, Carl Baker borrowed it on the same day that I loaned it to him. And when he returns it, and we'll say he kept it for 10 days, now it's returned. So there's the return transfer, the borrowing transfer, the status of the owner, and the seller. That's how we handle transfers. Now we can delete transactions. And notice that uh, even though I didn't go through this process of selecting, I can manually select an item here. But I'm just going to delete these transfers, which really haven't happened because they're listed in the future anyway. With that, 
I believe we've covered all of the functional aspects of the database. There are some uh, lookup tables, genre, media condition, media type, uh, and this tally table. Now I'll explain the tally table briefly here. We'll use it actually on the Power Apps application side. But all Access developers, I believe, uh, are familiar with uh, a tally table. It's simply a list of values that we use to iterate a process or to we can use them in queries to generate a, uh, a full list even if we have missing values. They're used in many ways. I, I use them in, in place of the uh, missing looping structures in Power Apps, and I'll explain that in more detail when we get to that stage of the development. With that, I believe we've covered all of the fundamental uh, aspects of the uh, desktop side. Let's go back to the publication, and I will point out one of the things that I wanted to do was to create a link to the cover photos. But I can't really take photos in this environment without uh, attaching a camera to my laptop. And since that is a fairly uh, complicated thing to do, uh, rather than try to implement it here, we implemented it on the Power Apps application side. The link that is here is grayed out because it's actually a live link on a cloud storage location that I don't want to expose the URL for that. But it's actually uh, an Azure Blob storage account uh, where uh, images are uploaded for use as cover photos for our books. And with that, we'll end this session and come back later with a next installment where I will show you how the Power Apps application side looks compared to this with the additional implementation of the ability to take a cover photo. If you like what you see, uh, please hit the like button and subscribe and come back for the next installment. Thank you.